nice to get uh, a warm applause. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm here all the way from uh, New York uh, via Singapore, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and now Tokyo. Um, so I'd love to get an idea of who's here. Um, just uh, how many of you have been to China already uh, more than once? Everybody here? Okay. And how many are doing business in China? And how many are covering China as a journalist? I think there are a few. A few? Okay. All right. Good. That gives me, a, it gives me an idea here. Uh, so, uh, Tech Titans of China is actually my third book. I didn't really start to do, I mean to do a series, but it ended up being a series because the first book was Silicon Dragon which was about uh, China's internet entrepreneurs and people like Jack Ma of Alibaba and that's me with Jack in 2006 uh, in Hangzhou uh, at his office then and Jack I think he looks a lot better today <laughs> and he certainly dresses a lot better uh, and then uh, the other person I'm with uh, on the other picture is Kaifu Li and back then Kaifu was running Google China and he was fighting with Baidu, uh, one of the Chinese tech titans. So 10 years is really a long time. A lot can happen in a decade. And in China, it all moves in super speed. So a lot happens. And a lot has happened. Uh, so the Chinese bought Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent have all grown up. And they've powered up. Uh, they've become uh, active in many economic sectors. Uh, beyond what their original business model was. And today, uh, Tencent and Alibaba rank among the 19 most or 10 most pub valuable publicly traded companies, which is uh, very remarkable considering they're very young companies. And uh, they came from China, have China roots and China founders and China markets. Uh, so it gives you an idea of what's been happening in China in the tech sphere. Now, their founders have also gone on to become billionaires. They are tech titans, or tech tycoons in this case. Uh, Robin Lee, the founder of Baidu, who is there um, on the left. And that's Joe Zai in the middle. Um, I took all these photos, by the way. Uh, that photo of Robin I took at Baidu, at Baidu World Congress in Beijing. Uh, the photo of Joe Zai I took last year at uh, in Shanghai at 11:11. Uh, the third one is Pony Ma, the very reclusive Tony, uh, Pony Ma, who doesn't really like to talk to the press very much. Uh, but Tencent is one of those uh, very remarkable tech titans that's emerged. <coughs> Uh, but from the original bot, the Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, there's a whole new group of tech brands that have uh, surfaced. And uh, they are ByteDance. Uh, ByteDance is the maker of Tutiao uh, and TikTok. And we all know that TikTok uh, is the 15 second video app that's been, you know, in some uh, hot water, so to speak, uh, in the US over uh, potential censorship issues. Uh, so these uh, Chinese tech companies are starting to get uh, really global attention. Uh, another one is Didi. It has sprung up as well. It's in the Uber equivalent uh, in China, and it actually beat Uber in China. Uh, Didi uh, ended up absorbing the Uber business in China. The one in the middle with the scooters, the yellow scooters, uh, that is Meituan. Uh, this is the super app uh, that is a new business model that's emerged in China that uh, is not common in the West yet. So that on Meituan you can get instant food delivery, you know, book hotels, uh, check out restaurant recommendations, uh, and uh, it's more like a lifestyle app, but also ride uh, on-demand delivery. Uh, the the next one over is Xiaomi. Uh, that's me in front of Xiaomi's headquarters in Beijing. And Xiaomi is the Chinese smartphone maker that is considered the Apple of China. Uh, and it's very advanced uh, in that it has a whole number of apps built into, into Xiaomi. And Xiaomi's a lot less expensive than the iPhone is. 
The last one is DJI, the drone company, out of Shenzhen, southern China. Uh, DJI is very innovative. All, all of these companies are privately held uh, still, except for Meituan. Um, oh, actually, the two in the middle are not anymore because they just went public last year. Uh, Meituan went public last year in Hong Kong, and uh, Xiaomi uh, did too in Hong Kong. DJI is still private, the drone company from Shenzhen. It's the world leading drone maker and it has a 75% market share. So these, the, this is the new breed, and there's a lot more behind this. The, this is just the tip of the iceberg, these, these ones. But what's happened today is we've seen this idea from copy to China, which was the original model, to, to, to today copy from China. And uh, in the middle was from copy to China, invented in China, to today copy from China. And this is what is happening today. This is in the headlines today. Facebook is copying WeChat and copying TTL. Uh, Amazon is, in a way, copying Alibaba and Alibaba's new retail. Uh, Starbucks is copying Luck and Coffee. Luck and Coffee is the upstart coffee brand in China that uh, is growing really fast. It actually went public last year too in New York and uh, it is giving Starbucks uh, a real challenge. And in fact, Starbucks is now copying the Starbucks or the Luck and Coffee on-demand delivery model. Same thing with Lime Bike. Lime Bike is the bike sharing company in that's, uh, that uh, started up in California. But I happen to know the founders of Lime Bike, and I know that they have China experience, and I know that they copy Mobike and Ofo. Uh, Mobike and Ofo were two of the originators in China of the bike sharing model, and that was another made in China business model. Today, uh, we are seeing these, these uh, tech titans innovating faster, being copied, going global. Uh, for the first time and getting attention for going global. Their founders and their whole staff uh, is working really hard. So you know if you're an entrepreneur, it's, it's just a natural that you're going to work uh, many, many hours and not get much sleep. But in China, this is all very exa exaggerated. So that uh, this 996, it's known as 996 because it's 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. But I think it's more like, you know, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week. Uh, that's been my experience when I go to China. And, I, and I'm there regularly. I'm there quite often uh, in Beijing and Shanghai and Shenzhen and elsewhere. Uh, and I have to say it's really just nonstop. I think if you look at the history, you would say, yeah, okay, well, look, maybe not all this tech entrepreneurship that has happened in the past decade and a half from China, maybe it's not all that surprising, considering that China really has an entrepreneurial culture anyhow, uh, and it's, it was long suppressed, but it's now risen to the surface again. So China gave us a lot of today's very useful um, devices so that that we use, such as paper, um, gunpowder. I, you know, I don't fireworks, uh, the compass, uh, the printing press. It all, you know, that's relevant here at the Foreign Correspondence Club. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of, uh, a lot of new ideas were always bubbling forth from China. But uh, today you have these new catalysts from China that are pushing it forward. Uh, you have the government uh, from China's of wanting China to be a world leader in technology. And uh, this Made in China 2025 has given uh, China roles, designated roles by uh, what time uh, they're going to lead in what sectors. It's very, very defined. Um, the whole Belt and Road Initiative that China has, <coughs> making friends with its neighbors, making economic friends with its neighbors. It's something that the U.S. has not been very good at lately. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, definitely not very good at lately. Uh, we're making enemies with Canada, Mexico, and other countries around the world. But uh, China is making friends with its Belt and Road Initiative of building out infrastructure for other countries. And uh, this is a rather controversial 
uh, move because uh, what happens is if those countries can't pay for that infrastructure, uh, guess who ends up owning it? That, you know, that China takes it over. So you could see ports or railroads or these kinds or bridges uh, being taken over by Chinese and other countries. I think some of the other catalysts that uh, are pushing China's tech uh, entrepreneurship forward are the, the uh, enormous amount of capital that's gone in. Then, now this is venture capital. Some of it is government spending, yes, yeah, sure. Some of it is government spending, but a large part of the tech boom, of this tech entrepreneurial boom, is from private sources, private venture capital. And that venture capital is from uh, largely from the US. Uh, it originated from Sand Hill Road, which is uh, Silicon Valley, right next to Stanford University, where all the venture capital firms have a base. So you talk about the infrastructure is really first rate in China in many Chinese cities. It's far more sparkling and new and just everything works right in China's major cities. This is not the case in the rural areas, but in the major cities like Shanghai, everything is up to date and it helps, uh, it helps these tech ideas move faster. Uh, and so I think that this is part of the whole uh, catalyst that's you know, uh, pushing China forward is that this speed and the pace, the consumer boom, all these young, young, digitally savvy consumers in China, they take to new ideas really quickly. And if they don't like something, they also will discard of it very quickly too. So it's a great uh, testing market uh, for uh, whatever will work digitally. Uh, now, this photo of Hertz Lin of DCM Ventures, he is a venture capitalist in, and he splits his time between Shanghai and Beijing. He was also the founder of Sina, uh, which was the Yahoo of China. So that was one of the original copy to China models. So Hearst is kind of guilty of that, but he made a lot of money doing that. And now he's a venture capitalist. Uh, but I took this photo of Hearst in Beijing at the, um, at the um, uh, New World Hotel uh, of him using two types of smartphones to kind of keep up with what's going on. Uh, so I don't know how many people here have two types of smartphones, but I certainly don't. Just having one is tough enough to keep up with, right? I think China has gotten ahead because it's leapfrogged. It never had a lot of the legacy systems that we have, that the West has. Uh, cash. China leapfrogged over cash and has gone to mobile payments. Email. Email's dead in China, cash is dead in China, it's all WeChat, it's all mobile payments, Alipay, WeChat Pay, uh, PCs. PCs never got the penetration level that they got in the West, so everyone went to mobile. So a lot of the new ideas that are c coming from China today are around mobile apps. They're not around the internet, uh, it's all about apps. Business cards um, have totally been replaced by QR codes. Uh, shopping malls, never really had a built out shopping mall system in China, so look, they could go right to new retail. New retail is these brand new supermarkets and department stores that have all the latest gadgets built into them like robots uh, and um, uh, mobile payments and augmented reality so that you can look at uh, whatever the ingredients of whatever is being on display. You can see when it was shipped. Um, where it was shipped from, when it arrived, what, what, what's in it. Um, so these are things that we really don't have in the West. Um, now, another idea that has uh, come out of the new China is these mini shops, M-I-N-I -I shops, which are actually baked right into uh, the super apps. So while you're on an app and you're doing messaging and you're chatting and you're video chatting and all that, you can also go on to these branded mini shops uh, on WeChat. And this has become very popular just recently. Uh, and a lot of even Western brands have mini shops on, on these Chinese apps. I also point out that gas-powered engines uh, were 
uh, you know, the car uh, was, you know, when I remember when I first started going to Beijing and Shanghai, it was all bicycles, right? And then it became cars, um, and now it's becoming electric vehicles. Uh, so the car market, uh, it just didn't have those years and years like Detroit had of everyone owning a gas-powered car, you know, a Chrysler or Ford or whatever, or a Buick, everyone had one, and some people had two of them or three of them. Well, in China, you know, in some cases, their first vehicle was an electric vehicle. And so again, this is that whole leapfrogging um, aspect that I mentioned before. Mobility. Uh, this mobility is an area that is ripe for disruption and is, uh, it is being disrupted. Uh, you see high-speed trains, you see the longest sea bridge in the Greater Bay Area, you see the new airports, uh, all of this is in forward motion and China has a jump on that. It's leapfrogging because it didn't have the legacy systems, it doesn't have, didn't have the old roads that had to be repaved over and over again or the old, the old turnpikes that are just outdated today or the old Amtrak. Uh, so, you know, high-speed trains are just everywhere in China today. We have gone to a new era of tech uh, where China is in all of these, all of these leading sectors of technology, uh, 5G, 5G is the new telecom standard that's going to speed up all of our communications. AI, uh, it is a foundational technology that will impact and is already impacting a lot of what we do in finance, in healthcare, in education, uh, and uh, other fields as well. Speech recognition, facial recognition. Uh, China is getting ahead in AI and it's implementing it faster because China doesn't have these real data privacy issues that uh, are so prominent in Europe and, and the US, for instance. Uh, China has gotten ahead in some cases in biotech because also, again, there are fewer restrictions around what can be done. So, you know, things like the first gene-edited babies came out of, out of China. Space exploration, uh, exploring the dark side of the moon, flying passenger drones, you know, drones, that, that's one there on the left uh, from a company called Ehang, which has a drone that you can actually fly in. <laughs> so that's launched just recently. recently. The sharing economy. Uh, so in China today, it's always been you know a sharing society, but sharing has really taken off. Just not only from bikes, but shared umbrellas, shell, shared uh, battery chargers. Uh, so the sharing economy is very strong. Uh, another uh, aspect of this tech boom is the social credit uh, system in China, where you get a score based upon your behavior, basically. Uh, if you do something naughty, uh, that counts against you. If you do something good, uh, well, that also can count. But if you get too many negatives, that can actually restrict you from getting credit, uh, from buying train tickets. Uh, so let's say you're out here jaywalking. They have cameras all over that are watching everything. So that's going to get recorded, and you know, all of a sudden you've got a bad score for that. If you don't repay your loan then that's another thing that's a huge negative and that'll be taken into account. So this social credit system is, is becoming part of China's uh, culture and it's accepted in China like it's not accepted in the West, but it's accepted in China. Now I do think that there are certain sectors that China is catching up in. It has a long way to go before it can uh, really rival the West. And one of these areas is semiconductors. Uh, those chips that make all of our devices work, uh, and the other is aerospace. Uh, so China doesn't really have a Boeing or um, an Airbus yet, um, but that could be coming. I, I mentioned before how digitally savvy China's market is, and I think uh, we have seen a lot of these new business models that are very much centered around the mobile app. So you have mobile entertainment, uh, you have mobile payments, you have social commerce which is built on mobile. Social commerce is again another new idea uh, from China with a company called Pinduoduo. Uh, it's an upstart from China, it's almost four years old now, but it's already the number two commerce app in China, just right behind Alibaba. 
And the reason it's caught up so quickly is that because it combine, it makes shopping online really fun. You can uh, chat with your friends on there. You can share deals with your friends. And the more people you get in to do a group buy, the bigger the discount is. And then people get uh, instant prizes, and it all becomes like a game. And you're all shopping online and wasting your time and buying more and more. <laughs> so this is the Pin Duo Duo model uh, from China. Um, now, I already mentioned super apps. It's, uh, again, it's, an, it's a China business model, and Meituan is a good example of it, and so is, WeCh and so is WeChat. Now, uh, look, uh, today, uh, if we're all reading the newspapers and watching television and radio, uh, this is a big theme today. These two superpowers of U.S. and China uh, competing with one another. Uh, the U.S is it feels threatened by China's rise and uh, has put blocks on sales to Chinese companies such as Huawei. Uh, there are new restrictions on selling to Chinese AI companies. There are new restrictions on foreign investments by China into the U.S. And the U.S. was a very active uh, investor into many of the leading companies uh, that came out of Silicon Valley like uh, Tesla even, uh, like Uber, uh, like Lyft, uh, like Magic Leap. So many of the leading uh, tech brands, the Chinese were behind. They were investing heavily in, but not anymore uh, because uh, the U.S. is pushing China back, saying, okay, enough is enough, you know, this, is, this has got to stop. Uh, and they're putting restrictions on venture capital investments. So before, um, if this is getting too deep into, I mean, this is really, these, this is happening now, and that's why I'm paying some attention to it right now, because all of these things are in, uh, are in motion right now, and uh, they could go uh, uh, to a much more advanced level and really push China back. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're facing right now. Uh, there's talk of potential ban on listings of Chinese companies in the U.S. Um, look, this isn't the first time that China's felt threatened, right? Uh, remember the 1990s, right? Japan in Rockefeller Center, Japan in Pebble Beach, and so now, you know, China it is not that uh, high profile of an investor. It, it's been uh, a little under the radar, but now because Washington DC is making it a real prominent issue and Trump is pushing back, it's become uh, a mainstream issue and a political issue. It's become politicized. And it's become uh, popular in the US uh, to say China is stealing China has an unfair advantage. Uh, China never really had competition from the West because China restricted it. China didn't allow Google or Facebook or Twitter or, uh, or some media companies in uh, for that matter either. And they're all blocked today. So you go to China, there's no way you can get on them. You have to go to the Chinese equivalent or you have to have a VPN uh, to get on. Uh, so. And even with sometimes with a VPN, you still can't get in. It'll be blocked, depending upon what's happening in Beijing that day or in Shanghai. If there's a big government meeting, uh, the restrictions are a lot stronger. <clears throat> so on, on this idea of the unfair advantage that this is how the West sees it, this is how Washington, D.C. is seeing it today, and this is playing out as a news angle today, an unfair advantage that China's had, and we're not going to take it anymore. We, we are going to push back on this forced technology transfer that's been going on for the longest time. Uh, we are going to um, push back on this whole idea of the copying of U.S. Uh, models. And uh, look, um, and you know, if you look at some of these of these uh, drivers of China's tech growth, then you realize that the U.S. really doesn't have an equivalent. So these, some of these, some of these unfair advantages stem from the government pushing money into uh, into technology and making China uh, a world leader or moving toward a world leader. 
So on the unfair, on the unfair advantage, uh, I usually argue that, okay, yeah, sure, I, I agree that China had an unfair advantage and used it against Western companies. But on the other hand, when you saw Western companies go in to China, they largely failed. Uber uh, was um, fighting with Didi for many years and then finally surrendered because the, the money losses were so huge. Uh, they got into a huge price cutting war. Same thing with eBay and Alibaba. Alibaba just trounced eBay. Baidu won, won the market battle against Google. Uh, Google uh, didn't localize as, could not localize as well in search as Baidu could. And had Baidu had a superior search algorithm than Google did. So in each one of these cases, you know, it, it's partly on the failure of these, of the managerial failure of these companies, these American multinational companies. It wasn't just that the unfair advantage, it was that there were also managerial mistakes, sending in managers who didn't speak the language, uh, causing them to get okay from California for every minor decision that was made. And so this helped the Chinese uh, companies uh, solidify their lead. And today, the, in many cases, there's no catching up. Uh, it, it would be impossible for eBay to uh, take the lead over Alibaba or Amazon to take the lead over Alibaba in China. That's gone. Alibaba owns it, and Alibaba is going global into many other countries as well. So same thing with Didi. Didi is, no, Didi is the ride-hailing company that beat Uber. Didi is no longer just in China. They're moving into Southeast Asia, and they're taking the same business model into Southeast Asia. And uh, it, you know, it's very interesting that not only did this Uber DD battle happen in China, but it happened in Southeast Asia too. And DD won in both cases. Now I think that uh, we could see more U.S. companies or Western companies failing in China. Well, the WeWork model, we, we all know that WeWork's already in trouble, right? Uh, and uh, it's fighting a very fierce um, local challenger in Yu Commune. Now, I've met the founder of U Commune, and I wouldn't want to do business against him for anything. Uh, so WeWork is, uh, has its work caught, uh, cut out for it, trying to uh, catch some of the new innovative ideas that U Commune has, like facial recognition to get into the work workspace, and uh, color coded, and uh, more um, more. Uh, more digitalization built into each one of its desks so that the desk becomes a movable office. Uh, it's not longer, no longer just a co-working space, but it's kind of a, a co-working desk that can be transported to wherever you are. 